Please open your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28. We're going to be looking this morning at Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. The title of the message, Jesus Will Give You Rest. Let me just say at the outset, as we uh, we look at this passage of Scripture, it is an appeal to the lost to come to Christ for salvation. So as such, that will be the thrust of this message, is an appeal to the lost, to come to Christ for salvation and see what that salvation entails. Now for the Christian, a passage like this should lead us and draw us to have the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ on the lost, knowing what they do not have as they set apart from Christ. It should be a means of motivation when we consider the state of the lost, what they're facing, what they will face, should give us that desire and that urgency to take the gospel to them, that they might believe and be saved. So let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. That, uh, Lord, for those that are able to sing, it is well with our soul. God, we do thank you for that because it is not well with our soul based on anything we did, but because you have saved us. God, I pray that as we look at the text this morning, God, we would see that those that are in rebellion against you, Lord, they have no rest. They need you. They need to come to you. Father, I pray that they would. God, I pray that, uh, that, that your word would be communicated accurately and clearly. God, I understand that all I bring to this task is weakness. Lord, but I pray for your strength, knowing, Lord, that it is made sufficient. It is sufficient for my weakness. God, I pray you would give me your grace. I pray you'd give grace to those that are hearing And God, I pray most importantly that as we look at this text, our eyes would look unto Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. If we get a little bit of a running start here, we saw two weeks ago, Jesus gave a declaration of the sovereignty of God. He prayed in verse 25, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. The Lord of heaven and earth. He is the supreme ruler of his universe. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We are subject to God. God is not subject to you. He is not subject to me. If we fail to acknowledge that we are subject to God and we live our lives as though God is subject to us, we will make a mess of our lives. Now, when we look at verse 25, we may not fully understand why the Father chose to hide the mighty works of Jesus from the wise and the prudent, and he chose to reveal them to babes. However, we know in verse 26, we have a declaration of the goodness of God. Jesus prayed, even so, Father... For so it seemed good in your sight. It was the good pleasure of God, who alone is wise, to do this. God's will is perfect. Everything he does is good. And then finally, leading in, in verse 27, we have the declaration of the exclusivity of salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus says, All things have been delivered to me by my Father, And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. 
It is the good and perfect will of the Father to reveal the Son to babes. It is the good and perfect will of the Son to reveal the Father to babes. Remember, Jesus is not a way to salvation. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. So as we look at verses 28 through 30 this morning, keep the sovereignty of God in mind. Keep the goodness of God in mind. And keep the exclusivity of salvation through Jesus Christ in mind. As we consider the words of Jesus, where he commands those who labor and are heavy laden to come to him, to take his yoke upon him, and to learn from him. So let's look to the Bible with ears to hear and a heart to obey. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look to your Bible, verse number 28. Here we're going to see the command that Jesus gives. Come to me. Now Jesus is not requesting the hearer to come to him. Jesus is Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. As God, Jesus is the supreme ruler of the universe. He is commanding the hearer to come to him. Therefore, to not come to him is to disobey the supreme ruler of the universe. In Matthew 4, 17, Jesus said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was commanding those he was speaking to, to turn from their sins. Those who chose not to repent and believe, they would remain dead in their trespasses and sins. Those who chose to repent and believe would be saved by grace through faith. So look to your Bible again, verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor. Jesus is going to give us two descriptions of those he calls. Come to me, all you who labor. The Greek word, translated labor, comes from a word that means to have been beaten. In Luke 5, Jesus gets into a boat that belongs to Simon Peter. He says to Simon, he says, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon says to Jesus, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. That word translated toiled in Luke 5 is the same word translated labor here in Matthew 11. After a long and difficult night of fishing, Simon Peter was beat. The word labor is in the present tense. What that means for us is the people were being beat down each day. Every single day of their life, they were laboring. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. The Greek word translated heavy laden, again, it comes from a word meaning to have been loaded down with something. In Acts 27, the apostle Paul is being transferred to Rome by ship. Paul uses the root word for heavy laden, and he uses it to describe the cargo that had been loaded down on that ship. So if you think about that concept in your mind, as that cargo is loaded on the ship, the ship goes further down into the water. Now these same men, when they encountered a storm, they threw some of the cargo into the sea to lighten the load that they were bearing. Now, the phrase heavy laden is in the perfect tense. So what does that mean For us, it means the people had been loading down with a burden that they were not able to get off on their own. They had been loaded down with cargo that they were unable to unload on themselves. It was there. They weren't getting it off. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Now God has given us his law. The law is holy and good. 
because the lawgiver is holy and good. The law must be used lawfully. It was never designed as a means to earn salvation. The just shall live by faith. The law was never designed to give life. The law was established to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Remember, church, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So when Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, he was speaking to a group of people that the religious leaders of the day had messed a lot of things up for him, had added so much to the law. They had added so many things that were not necessary. As a result, they were adding to the burden the people were bearing. Jesus describes these religious leaders in Matthew 23. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So when Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, he's speaking to a group of people who are trying to climb a mountain and get to the top, and they never could. They were not going to be able to do it. And as they're climbing, as they're striving to get to the top of this mountain, they're carrying on their back a pack that they were not designed to carry. So Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Look to your Bibles, verse 28. I want you to see the promise that Jesus gives to those who will come. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, please don't confuse the rest that Jesus is promising as he calls those who labor and are heavy laden. It's not an invitation by Jesus for them to come and retire to his lake house on the sea of Lake Galilee and live a life of ease. That's not what he's promising at all to them. Jesus told a scribe in Matthew 8, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now we're going to look at this much closer in verse 29. But for our purposes now, when Jesus says, I will give you rest, Jesus is calling all who labor and are heavy and are heavy laden. He's calling them to come to him for salvation. That's the rest he's promising to them. So look at your Bible, verse 29. And I want us to see the instructions that Jesus gives to those who come to him. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. We've got two additional commands here from Jesus. Those who come to Jesus must take his yoke upon themselves and learn from him. Now, coming to Jesus means more than just coming into his proximity. Judas shows us that proximity to Jesus does not equal salvation. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This is not a command simply to observe Jesus and to learn about him. He says, learn from me. Matthew 19 records the actions of a man who came to Jesus yet stopped short. A man who chose not to take Jesus' yoke upon himself and learn from him. This man ultimately turned away from Jesus and went back in pursuit of his false god. This young man is known to us as the rich young ruler. And he came to Jesus and he said, What good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. The young man said, Which ones? 
Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was using the law here in its intended purpose. He was using it to show this young man that no matter how hard he might try, he could not measure up to the perfect righteousness God demands in his law. For whoever shall keep the whole law, yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Jesus was using the law to show this young man that as hard as he may try, he had sinned and he had come short of the glory of God. Now this young man should have said to Jesus, I am laboring. I have tried to keep all the law and I cannot do it. He should have said, I am heavy laden. I am weighed down by what the Pharisees have added to the law. This young man should have said to Jesus, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Instead, the young man said to Jesus, all these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? This prideful young man thought he had kept the law. However, he knew he was still short of eternal life. He was saying to Jesus he had done it all, and he still didn't have it. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go. Sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Again, Jesus isn't showing him works-based salvation. He's trying to reveal this man's heart. Use the law to show this man that he needed to repent and believe. The Bible says, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This man loved his possessions with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind. He did not love the Lord, God, with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all of his mind. He had broken the first and great commandment. This young man did not have compassion for the poor. He did not love his neighbor as himself. On those two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So let's look at your Bible, verse 29. I want us to look closely at the two commands Jesus gives to those who come to him. The first command, take my yoke upon you. In his dictionary of the Bible, J.D. Davis defines a yoke as a small transverse bar of timber, generally with two portions of the lower surface hollowed, so as to rest on the necks of the two oxen used to draw a cart or plow. I've got a picture up there on the screen so you can see what a yoke looks like to give us an understanding of what Jesus is talking about. The second command Jesus gives in verse 29 is learn from me. That word translated learn is related to the word we see a disciple throughout the New Testament. Jesus is emphasizing the instructor and the student relationship. He's saying come and learn from me. So when we see the command here take my yoke upon you and learn from me It is a call to discipleship. Jesus is calling upon the lost to come and be his disciples. Matthew 11, 29, once again, let's look at the description here that Jesus gives of himself. He's already described those he's calling as those who labor and are heavy laden. Here he says, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. The word translated gentle here is from the word that's translated meek earlier in the Gospel of Matthew. This word is described as power under control. The the phrase lowly in heart describes one brought low. If you think about the word humility, that's what's captured here. So remember, think about Jesus for a moment who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. 
And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So when Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly in heart, he's describing himself as one who has power under control, whose life is marked by humility. As Jesus describes himself as gentle and lowly in heart, he's demonstrating that he will not use force to accomplish what he's he's commanding us to do. A farmer may force a yoke upon his oxen. Jesus won't force his yoke upon anyone. He'll call on you to come, to take his yoke, and to learn from him. By describing himself as gentle and lowly in heart, Jesus is demonstrating that he is the Messiah. Those that that knew the Old Testament, when they heard that description, their minds would have gone to Isaiah 42 uh, 42 verses 2 and 3, where the servant of God is described, he will not cry out nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. Jesus presented himself to the people as the Messiah, as the one sent by God to save his people from their sins. Now, let me address an objection that may come up right now. What about the one here? who has not come to Jesus, who has not taken his yoke upon you and is not learning from him. And your objection right now is, why should I yoke myself to Jesus when I'm free? Why should I yoke myself to Jesus when I am free? And the answer is simple, because you're not free. You may think you're free, but you're not free. You are entangled with a yoke of bondage, according to Galatians 5. Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And Jesus said in John 8, 36, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So while you may think there's no yoke upon your neck, there is. You're in bondage to sin. Look to the Bible, verse 29. And here we see again, The promise that Jesus gives to those who come to him, who take his yoke upon themselves and learn from him. And Jesus says, and you will find rest for your souls. Once again, the student of the Old Testament, the Israelite there that had read and studied the Old Testament, their minds would immediately go to Jeremiah 6, 16, because that's what Jesus is pointing them to. It says, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. Those with eyes to see and ears to hear would know that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises of God. I mentioned at the end of verse 28, the rest that Jesus is speaking of here is of salvation. The rest is not the end of work. Children of God are saved by grace through faith, and we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The rest here that Jesus is promising is a rest from working for something that you could not achieve, and that is righteousness on your own. I want you to look at three things about this promise that I believe are important for us to understand. Jesus says, I will give you rest, and you will find rest for your souls. Notice the certainty there in the verse. The Bible doesn't say you might find rest for your souls. The Bible doesn't even say you will likely find rest for your souls. The Bible says you will find rest 
for your souls. Second, there's a joy that accompanies this promise. The English word, and it's not used very often anymore, but there's an English word that's eureka. It comes from this same Greek word that's translated, you will find. The English word eureka is used to celebrate something being discovered. Think about that in the context of the lost sinner. When the lost sinner finds salvation in Christ, that is a discovery to rejoice over. Think about the parable of the lost coin. Jesus said in Luke 15, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So when Jesus says, you will find rest for your souls, when he promises, this is what you'll find, there is joy in it. Think about this woman described in the parable as she joyfully celebrates the recovery of that coin. I found it. I found it. I found it. Now think about the lost sinner joyfully celebrating. I have been saved. I have been saved. I have been saved. I have found rest. I have found rest. Last thing I want us to see is that there's a security in this promise. And the security rests in the one making the promise. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The one who comes to Jesus, who takes his yoke upon themselves and learns from him, need not worry about Jesus changing the terms and conditions and having that promised rest taken from you. There is a certainty where Jesus says you will find rest for your souls, and it rests, that certainty rests, in the one making the promise. I want to go a little deeper for a moment in that word rest, and I want to draw your minds back to the Israelites. As they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, They rebelled in unbelief. The Bible says in Hebrews 3, For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey, so that they could not enter in because of unbelief? belief. The author of Hebrews then gives us the application of what's being stated in chapter 4. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. That phrase In Hebrews 4, entering his rest is in the present tense. So you can sit here this morning, and if you are saved, you can state with the certainty of the Word of God, you have found rest. You have it right now. It's not something that you are waiting for. You have it. And the opposite of that is true as well. If you're not saved, you do not have rest does not matter how you think you do. If you are not saved, you do not have rest. Second thing I want us to see there is there will be folks who will have the gospel preached to them that will not enter his rest. And the reason, it comes down to faith. They did not mix their hearing of the gospel with faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 11.6, But without faith... It is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek 
him. Let's look to the Bible at verse number 30, and I want us to see the description Jesus gives of his yoke and his burden. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let me address another objection that may come up at this point. Again, speaking to the one who has not come to Jesus, who has not taken his yoke upon you, who is not learning from him, and you're shaking your head right now and you're saying verse 30 makes no sense. And your objection is this. How can a yoke be easy and a burden be light? Isn't a yoke by its very nature hard? And isn't a burden heavy? Now, if we were to read this about an easy yoke and a light burden anywhere else, I'd respond the same way. However, we're reading this in the Bible. We're reading this in the Word of God. And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So when Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, I trust him because he's God. I trust this to be true. By faith, I trust this to be true because it's coming out of the very mouths of our Lord Jesus Christ. But here's another layer to that. Because as a Christian, if you're here this morning and you have come to Jesus, you have taken his yoke upon you, you are learning from him, you know from experience this to be true. You know from experience that his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Because you remember what your life was like when you had another yoke upon your neck. So you know by experience his yoke is easy and his burden is light. The yoke, once again, points to being taught by Jesus. It means to be his disciple. The word easy, according to Vine, signifies fit for use. Now think about that phrase for just a moment, fit for use. Each person in here right now has a yoke upon you. If you're lost, you're wearing the yoke of bondage to sin. It's difficult to wear. It doesn't fit right. It pokes you. It's constantly a source of irritation in your life. The saved wear the yoke of Jesus. It fits perfectly. It fits as it is intended. It accomplishes the purpose that it is designed for. The word burdened is the noun form of that same word heavy laden in verse 28. It's talking about the cargo that we carry. So you think about when you have the yoke of Jesus upon you, the burden is light. When you're walking with Christ, as, uh, as was shared in Sunday school this morning, we talked a little bit about this, just in the providential kindness of God. You're yoked to your Savior. You're not yoked to sin anymore. The Bible says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Christian is yoked to the Savior, no longer yoked to sin. The Christ, for the Christian, we make direct application here for the Christian. Do you remember the response Jesus had in Matthew 9 when he saw the multitudes? Do you remember the response Jesus had when he saw the multitudes? He was moved with compassion for them. Why? Because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Now, we will encounter lost folks who seem to have it all together. Seemingly good people, nice house, new cars, kids doing well academically, kids doing well athletically. But know this, if they have not taken the yoke 
of Christ upon themselves, they are laboring with a heavy burden. No matter how they may present ourselves to us, if they have not taken the yoke of Christ upon themselves, they are laboring with a heavy burden, and they have no rest right now because there is no rest apart from Christ. And what rests upon the Christian here is we're to plead with them to come to Jesus. Let them know that He will give them rest. As Christians, we must commit ourselves to Jesus' commission. The Bible says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Make disciples of all the nations. The Christian, as we think about what it means to take the yoke of Jesus upon us and to learn from Him, we must ask ourselves the question, are we personally learning from Jesus each day by reading the Bible, studying the Bible, praying. Is that a discipline in our lives that we're personally learning from Jesus? If you're a Christian here this morning, a professing Christian, do you desire the pure milk of the Word of God that you may grow thereby? The Christian is to be growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as the Christian, is there a compassion for those that do not have the rest that we have But also, is there a commitment? Is there a genuine desire to grow in the Christian life? Finally, here this morning, if you're lost, if you've never come to Jesus in repentance and faith, I want you to imagine yourself as though you're in a boat in the middle of the ocean, and your boat has a hole in it, and the seas are rough, and they're crashing over the top, of that boat. The boat you took out into the ocean was never seaworthy to begin with. It had no business being out there. And the, the course you've taken has only made things that much worse. You have no paddle. You have no life jacket. You have nothing. And you're doing your best to limit the water coming in through the holes on the bottom and bail out the water that's crashing over the top. However, you can't stop it. The boat is taking on water, and you know it. You can see the water rise up from your toes to your ankles. Now it's getting in toward your knees. Someone pulls their boat alongside of you and says, Come, get in my boat. Their boat doesn't have a hole in the bottom. It's not taking on water. Their boat is designed to withstand the crashing waves. Their boat is everything that you wish your boat was. If you stay in your boat, you die. If you obey their command and you get in their boat, you live. Now the sad part of all this, there will be some people who would still refuse to obey the command to get out of their sinking boat and get in the boat that they need to be in. They'll stand in that boat pridefully thinking that they can fix the problem. All the while, the problem's getting worse and worse. But there will be others. There will be others who have labored. They've seen the water rise in their boat. They are burdened by the very thought of being in a sinking boat. And they will climb out of their sinking boat into the rescue boat. Jesus is that rescuer that calls to the lost and says, come to me. And when you come and when you climb out of your boat and you climb into his, you become a student of the captain of that boat. He shows you how the boat is to be driven. He shows you the path you're to take. That's what it looks like to be saved is to get out of your sinking boat, get into his, and follow him. 
So to the lost, Jesus died for your sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Hear and obey the words of Jesus this morning. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's take some time now as the piano plays to spend time in prayer. However God has met with you through this passage, I would plead with you to obey. Lord Jesus, I thank you that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. I pray that that no one would walk out of here this morning wearing the yoke of sin, being in bondage to it. Lord, but that they would come to you. They'd take your yoke upon themselves. They'd learn from you. God, I pray that they would find rest. And God, I pray for your church. Lord, help us to, to not believe that this rest is, is moving away from, from the spiritual work. Lord, but I pray you'd help us to walk in the good works that you've called us to, that you have prepared beforehand. But God, I pray that you'd help us to know and to do these things, knowing the type of yoke we have, one that is easy and a burden that is light. God, I thank you for salvation. Lord, I thank you for saving us. Lord, not one of us deserved it. Not one of us earned it. It was all by grace. And I pray, Lord, that that would drive us, Lord, to humility, recognizing what you did for us. Help us, Lord, as we walk by faith and not by sight. In Jesus' name, amen.